Okay, I mean, I've learned a lot today. I hope you all are too. I really enjoyed all the presentations except the one I have to talk. And in this one, I want to tie some of the stuff together and put really you know, just boots on the ground, practical spin to it, especially for us deer hunters. So I'm going to play a little video here. There are many lessons right here. I mean, like many, many lessons. First off, how old is this deer? Now, remember, this is the Ozarks. This is not Kansas. How old is this deer? Two, three, four, four, three, two. All right, typical deer hunter. All right, so this buck is going to be munching on Milo. Deer hunters call this Milo. The ag guys call it sorghum, different types of sorghum, whatever. But I want you to notice there are greener ones. Look at the one like towards his belly there, kind of sticking out like mine, and the browner ones. And Keith and I often put different types of Milo grain sorghums in blends because they will mature at different times. And deer really prefer Milo, like when they're really like getting on Milo is the milk stage. When it's super green like this, you watch this buck come by and smell a few of those things and just ignore them. And remember I told you earlier, deer are real finicky eaters. And look at that, real long nose, real narrow mouth. They're not, they're not just like I do, just shoveling it in, right? And like we're all taught, if you're trying to lose weight, lay the fork down in between bites. Slow down, lay the fork down in between bites. I'm like, ugh, ugh, ugh. So this buck eats that ripe Milo head. When I was young, and I lived through President Carter, not being political, interest rates were 18%, my dad built houses. So times were tough, we had a farm, you know, and that kind of carried us through. And we raised sweet corn for sale. And I, even though we'd pick it and we, we weeded it by hand, I'm the only boy in the family. My name could have been Manuel Labor, <laughs> literally. But this buck eats that milk stage Milo head like a member of the Woods family eating a near sweet corn. And I'll show you what I mean. He just stuck the Milo head in there and it's just gone. He just, he starts at one end, I wish that video was working, and it just went blah, 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 gone. He went right down it and he did not stop till it was all gone. And when deer find something they really like, they're just, they're just loading up. And the number one predator defense mechanism for a deer is not its nose, it's not its eyes, and it's not its ears. Anyone want to guess what it is? Stomach. Exactly. That big old rumen was created so it could get out in the open because they got to have photosynthesis. They're going out in the open to eat. They got to get where the sun is zero to three feet off the ground, more or less. Fill up that big rumen. They just ingest it. They're just getting it in, like me and Fudge. It's just going in. Then they go back in the cover, regurgitate it, chew it up more so the microbes got more surface area to work on and digest it. The microbes digest it back in the bushes. Because if you stay out in the open all the time, what happens? All right, watch him. Watch. Here's, here, perfect, here's the Woods family. Do, 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 do. That's that ear of corn just going. Margarine dipping down your chins right there. Watch him. Now watch that when it comes out of his mouth. Notice how his ears are articulating some. There's no Milo lift. That's just gone. The whole head of that is just gone. Here, come over here and smell a green one. Nah, you're not ripe yet. Oh, okay. This talk is about hidey hole food plots. This is on my place, the Proven Grounds 2. We sold the Proven Grounds after 20 years of work. People think I'm crazy because it was nice. It was really nice for the Ozarks. And I'm a worker. I'm a worker. And so I conned my wife into keeping the back 900 acres where I hadn't done much and starting over. She gets a new house, I get a new project. Everybody's happy. So there's a little pond right here. And I want to talk about, and, and the reason I call them hidey old food plots, you go out, it's going to be the only food, unless there's acorn, zero three feet from the ground. That's why these are so successful as attracting deer to the camera or the bow or the gun. Here we go. That was just all timber. And we're felling trees. It's just leaves. There's no groceries down here. And here goes that same tree. We got the drone up. Boom. Now it looks real big, but look at the scale of the human there. That tree wasn't that big. Here's a pond over here. All right, so over here, very little sunlight getting to the ground. Up there, there's some sun. Got to have sun to make photosynthesis. C6H1206 and an O2 on the end. Keep going. And then you got to apply herbicide just to the cambium level. I love watching the videos where people are painting the middle of the tree some expensive herbicide. 
that, tree, that is dead. In a hardwood tree, all that is is dead cells supporting it so it can stand up. The only thing living is the cambium at the, at the stem level, the cambium. The xylem and phloem, the stuff taking nutrients up and down in the tree. So we'll put just a little herbicide on the outside edge. Next slide. And then I wait for a rain. Now, I've been planting other fields. I look like a skinny rat, I know, because I've been out in the rain for a couple hours planting. Seth is here with me running that camera. We were all planting like crazy. I'm an easy boss. As long as you work 12 hours a day and don't want paid, I'm a great boss. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> plant seed. Now, look, look how rocky is. These guys, the kids go, oh, my gosh, no one to plant that. Nothing to grow there. It'll be beautiful. So we're just spreading seed. Here's a little hint. You see, I got it tipped up. That's not just because I got belly. When you tip your broadcaster up, you get better coverage. Better coverage. Okay, next slide. And here we are just a little bit later. Now, you look at it before you start the video. It's not a perfect stand. There's some bare dirt. This was timber a few months earlier. But it's the only green within reach of a deer for quite some ways. And watch how selective it's smelling. No, I don't want that. Oh, oh, I like that. Look at that. Just devoured the whole plant. Found one I like. That happened to be a clover plant, just devoured it, go around, don't like that, don't like that. People think they're like cattle, just put their head down and start feeding. Seth is filming this, by the way. Using that nose, watch the ears go different directions. See it go back, because that's probably when I moved and stand, now it's going forward. It's just like you cupping your ear, you hear different directions. Uh-oh. Something big and ugly up there. And Seth, I'm deaf. I can't hear too well. Seth, I'm like, don't shoot, don't shoot. I can't see through you. Don't shoot. And I'm like, the cameraman's supposed to work it out and not tell the hunter what to do. Watch that Seth go, no, don't shoot. I'm like, Seth, that's venison standing out there, son. That's tenderloin. Gets on it. Uh-oh, she's going, uh-oh, it's looking bad, honey, death from above. Well, deer see about 120 degrees in front in binocular vision. Now, don't do this because you look really stupid. Let me tell you around. You look stupid. Now, I'll probably call you out and make fun of you, so I'll do it. But they have binocular vision, and that gives you depth perception. If they didn't have binocular vision, when they went to the acorn, they'd be bumping their nose. Oh, dang, I hit my nose again. All right? But on the side, because... Predators don't attack deer from the front. They have monocular vision. That's when the doe is walking sideways to you and you go to pull back and they bust you. Monocular vision is really great at seeing movement. Predators never killed a deer yet that wasn't moving. One like coyote just laid there and sucked them in with their tongue like an anteater. Predator got to move. And they come from the rear or the side. So God gave them tremendous side vision to avoid predators. That's why you got to draw carefully. Now, here's a hidey ho from Wisconsin, one of my guys in Wisconsin. Uh, and you can tell there's a big ag field up there. It's kind of an odd camera lens, so it makes it look like that's a ski slope. It's not that steep. And if you're a deer and your whole thing in life is survival, would you rather come out here in the shadows, you know, early morning, late evening, or go step out in the middle of a hundred acre field? You won't be here because you're close to cover. When you're shooting at a deer, you know, you draw back, your elbow's up, you're just like, I'm hitting this guy right in the eyeball right now. I mean, I'm right on him. That deer is going to do two things when the bow goes off, because a compound bow has to make noise. You know, Matthews, I work for Prime, all these different companies. I don't care what bow you shoot, when that wheel spins over and there's 60, 70 pounds of pressure on a string hitting a metal cable, it's making noise. Don't let any marketing fake you out. It's going to make noise. And noise travels, depending on where you are, speed of sound, about 1,100 feet a second, atmospheric pressure, all these things vary a little bit. And that's going faster than your 300-foot arrow. Make no doubt about it, the noise is getting to the deer faster than the arrow, even if you're shooting a crossbow. It's getting there faster. So we've done this measurement through some really cool instrumentation, and we shoot, and a speaker tells the deer, i.e. the computer downrange, we've shot, and then we calculate the speed of sound, and the speed of the arrow, and then the deer has to react just because they hear it like I hear stuff, but I can't react that quick, especially me, you know, I'm fat and old. But so we used the reaction speed of an Olympic sprinter. 
I don't think they are as fast as a deer, but that's the fastest reaction we humanly knew to use. Put that in a computer process, and even at that, the average deer, if the deer's going to respond, and they always drop. I read on the internet, and not often, because even though I make a living on the internet, I can't really stand it, and I hear about people jumping. You think about this. Deer have to drop to jump. They can't stand on, deer stand on their toes. We stand on our feet, they stand on their toes. They can't stand on their toes and jump. They've got to load the muscles. They've got to get in that sprinter position. So they're dropping. And the front drops more than the rear end. If you're really serious about it, we would shoot deer in the lever. The liver, because the liver doesn't drop as much as the front shoulders does. You watch a sprinter in the blocks, his liver is much higher than his lungs. Every time. Now deer either don't react or react. This is just simple. They can't like kind of react. They either react or don't react. And they're just hearing something. They're not saying, and I hear this, it's those lighted knocks spooking deer. The lighted knocks on the back of an arrow. The arrow's hopefully going at the deer. How could they see it? It's the sound. And they want to avoid getting eaten, so they drop and they turn away from the sound. They turn away, so you calculate that into your shot placement and you place your arrow expecting them to drop. So I always aim at the white line. You know the white brown line? Low, very low. Every shot I take at a deer, I'm aiming low. And if I hit low, it's a heart shot. And if they react, I'm in the lungs. Every shot, five yards, 25 yards. Hiding whole food plot is gonna be much more productive from a deer hunting point of view than the big field. Big field, I don't know where to put my stand or blind. This is when deer move. This all goes into high deal food plots and soil. They move dawn and dusk, daylight and dark. They're crepuscular, if you want that big old word. Crepuscular. Why is that? Why is that? Sight. I heard sight. Say it again. They're nocturnal. Heard that. They're not nocturnal to move daylight and dark. Sight. I get that at every seminar. I've, you know, I've spooked a lot of deer. I've, I've jumped a lot of deer walking in my stand, walking out stand. I've yet to hear one run into a tree. I, I would say in my lifetime I've jumped hundreds or hundreds of thousands of deer. I don't know. I've never heard one, oh, dang, I ran into a tree. I've never heard that. In pitch black. Everyone rumors that there is more crime on a full moon Saturday night. Google that. There's not. The emergency room's just as busy on the Saturday night that is dark. People get drunk on both Saturday nights when it's full moon and when it's not a full moon. That's just an old street tale. And deer can run in full darkness just fine because they have tapetum lucidium on the back of their eye. Again, this creation thing, it didn't evolve, it was created. Tapetum lucidium is like aluminum foil. Light goes in, triggers rods and cones, hits that, goes back out and triggers it again. And they have a bigger people, so they're all getting more light and they're getting twice the use out of light. Walleye do too, a lot of animals have it. When you're shining at night and it reflects back, that's because it's a tapetum lucidium and bounces back. They move here, I'll shorten this up, because what's happening my serious hunters in the room. What's happening at dawn and dusk? Temp who said temperature? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're typically going, unless there's an inversion or something, from at nighttime cooler to warmer. And when the sun is coming up, just like soil, we take soil temperature at 9 a.m. at 2 inches deep because the soil's losing heat all night. Sun has to get up to about 9 o'clock till it's 9 a.m. in the morning, that level you know, of the skyline until it's got enough heat to start warming it up. So the coldest time of the day, when you want to check your soil, see how cold it is, see if I can plant yet, should be about 9 a.m. Because that's the coldest time of the day, not at midnight at 9 a.m. It's changing. And when air is changing from warm to cold or cold to warm in the morning, it's going to swirl because over here there's a hole in the canopy and that's warming up. And over here it's shaded, it's cold. Or you're in north slope, you're on south slope, all these variables. And the air is swirling. It's not, we call them deer hunters, we call them day winds. Sometimes I will, and I'm an early morning person, it's not like I need to sleep. I'll wait till the day winds dart, because they're going to be constant, they're going one direction. But in the morning, you got there real early, I'm going to get there early, I'm going to wait for deer to come to me, and the wind's right, and the sun's coming up, and all of a sudden the wind's wrong. Deer move when they don't want to die. And that's daylight and dark, because that's when the wind's swirling, and they use their nose for predator defense at 360 degrees. That's why they move then. Now, you can kill a deer at noon, you can kill a deer at midnight if you're a poacher, uh, but the biggest deer movement based on lots and lots of GPS work, thousands and thousands, 
the vast majority of deer move. At, they, they're putting, and we measure this in yards per minute movement. Actual just moving, daylight and dark. So what's that have to do with the high food plot? I want my high food plot as close to bedding as it can be. Because if they're moving the most right at daylight and dark, and my high food plot's a mile and a half from cover or bedding area, I'm not going to see them probably. If I'm hunting in the afternoon, they don't get there in time for it's already dark, or in the morning they're already left, they're too far away. Here's my wind, I want my stand over there, right? But that, that's just elementary biology. I want to go on to where you're thinking. Here's where we failed a bunch of cedars. It's my place, made a bedding area, a thicket, and my food plot is about 60 yards through the timber. And you see this logging road on a west wind coming this way. I can walk up that road or come in the other way, different wind directions, not alert deer, get in that food plot and let them come to me. Or in the morning, they're all out here in the acorns eating. They want to stop by a little green to balance their diet and go back to cover. I want my hidey hole food plots as close to cover as I can get them and allow me to approach, hunt, and exit without alerting deer. It's just as important as watch a plant if you're going to be successful. Now, how do we create them? All right. That's Cerise Alexpediza, where that gentleman's walking over there. And this was the exact same stuff. It looked exactly the same, except we treated it with about 4% glyphosate. I told you earlier, I'm not anti herbicide, I just want to use it unless I have to. Knocked it down, get it brown enough to carry fire, and burn it. Now, Fire's going to put all your nitrogen out, but nitrogen's so volatile it doesn't matter. And as Keith said earlier, you know, tons and tons above us, it's just not an issue. And that makes my seed bed. Now, don't plant while it's still smoldering because you're going to bake the seed and you're going to die. You're going to have roasted, you know, sunflowers out there. But burn it, and then before a rain, spread it. Now, it looks like I worked this poor kid to death, but the rain just passed. See how dark it is? And we didn't get all our stuff planted right before a rain. Planting five minutes after rain is I'm going to say 70% worse than planting for rain. Raindrops fall with a fair amount of pressure, and I want it to help push the seed and make sure it's got contact with the soil. And we just, it, it was a pop-up shower type situation. We jumped in the buggies with some seed, grabbed our over-the-shoulders broadcasters, went and spread seed, and we just didn't complete in time. We re replanted this one, actually. And that's our fire break. I asked her, how do you burn? How do you burn? This was in summer. We burnt this. We just made a little fire break, dropped a match, and let one hatch. Everyone's so scared of fire because Smokey the Bear, and Smokey the Bear was perfect timing because people were burning at will, burning thousands and thousands of acres, houses, homes, dogs, children, stuff like that. Smokey was great at the time, but he outlived his time because North America was built under a fire regime. God used fire to stimulate new growth, new plants. It burned all the time. You read those explorers I showed you in the morning seminar, they often wrote about fire. And they weren't setting it. Now, it's always better to use a drill, because the drill's going to get the seed definitely in contact with the soil, cover it however much you set it to cover it, and you can plant without a rain being in the next 30 minutes, It'll, you know, as long as there's some soil moisture, it rains in the next week or something like that and get a crop. What I like to see a lot of deer hunters do, and this is, doesn't happen much in America more, is form a little drill co-op. Okay, I don't want to spend X thousand on a drill and use it twice a year because my wife doesn't want me to. So get two or three neighbors and share the cost of a drill. Or the NRCS office in most counties in America rent drills. That's a great program. Problem with renting a drill is, I used to rent a drill, problem with renting a drill is when it's perfect plant conditions, everyone wants to drill. And not everyone's a good steward of that great public resource. So Johnny used it for me and he broke it, but he didn't tell anyone. And now I get it and I got to fix it and I'm trying to plant. The drills with wheel kits for those that buy it in what I call a co-op or better so you can pull it down the highway without having to load on tractor or something like that. You can use these little drills with a UTV. Always go in low gear. There's a many transmissions that don't sound too good in the UTV because someone tried to plant too fast. UTVs were not made to pull a drill. They will pull a drill, but you need to be in lowest granny gear you can get. And a hidey hole food plot is not production. That has several ramifications. Deer can eat it to the ground. It can be nothing but dirt and turds real quick. You're planting hidey hole food plots to harvest and secondarily to improve soil because they're removing, they can remove so much biomass that you don't get all the benefits of what we were all 
all speakers were talking about earlier. You can make progress, but it's slower. Because, man, at that time of year, March, before spring green up, they're not as picky. They're just going to town. You can fence IDO food plots to keep deer out till you want to photograph or harvest deer in there. And I've done this, and it works. It's kind of a pain, and it's not as natural to me. It's just personal preference. I would rather have more high yield food plots and do a good job managing my native vegetation, kill some trees, get some sun to the ground, use some fires, and use these instead of fencing. But it's a viable, tool. it's a tool, it's a tool. Patrick did, covered this so well, I'm not going to really go into it. And, and I like interns, I like Patrick, because all I do is carry around a bucket and make him use a soil probe and jump on it literally to get between the rocks to get enough dirt in there to get a sample. But this is coming out of our winter crop, obviously you can see the crimson clover making heads in there and the big seed heads on the cereal rye here and there's oats and their stuff in there. And as Patrick did a great job of explaining, that just didn't feed deer all winter. That's my source of nutrients for my next crop. It's, I'm going to leave it right there and let it decompose. And this is where food plotters have such an advantage over production farming because we're not hauling that off and taking it to market. Our combine has four legs and our product is venison in the freezer. So a couple of scenarios here that work well. You can spray, like I showed you in that one, burn and put the seed down, hopefully right for a half inch or more rain. A quarter inch isn't really enough, I've just found from experience. Again, rain falls and has a pressure when it hits the ground, causes erosion obviously, uh, so it can help make the seed work through that residual vegetation slip and make contact with soil. It ensures there's ample moisture for germination. Seed in the bag back here is not germinating, right? You need moisture for germination. You can seed just before rain in that thick crop I was showing you. Seed really heavily, two or three times the recommended amount because a lot of it's not going to survive. And then mow. You want a mower that doesn't make a swath. You want it spread out like the crimper would or buffalo or cattle would make. And it works, it's not perfect, but it works. And then you can do what I like to do, you can just wait till that cereal grain, which is usually gonna be your most biomass, is in the dough stage, and you can drill right through it, and then you can crimp. That's, that's the ultimate in getting good stands and really improving your soil health quickly. But not all food platters food plotters have access to that. So I want to give you some other options. And don't be that person, well, I ain't got no no-till drill, I ain't working on that. That's just silliness. No one got ahead with that kind of attitude. That's just silliness. If you're spraying and burning, just realize that it's your, food, your soil's not gonna improve quite as quickly. But it's a whole lot better than sitting on the couch. We talked about the foot crimper and its work. And you see how we're putting a little oomph on it after we get down? You want to crimp the stem. You're just knocking it over. You want to crimp the stem. I like planting milo in my small plots because deer don't eat milo vegetation. You got to be a really hungry deer to eat milo or corn leaves. Really, really hungry. Now, young corn come out of the ground, heavily fertilizer, eat it. But once it gets very lignified or that we talked about really stiff cell walls, they're not going to eat it. So that shaded out most of my weeds. Now, this is a small little 30-yard by 30-yard hydeo food plot, and even though the seed heads are pretty green, they've removed most of them. You know, because if you're in Ethiopia, i.e. a closed canopy forest, and you're a deer, you're not too picky. If it's a green pickup pulls in there, you're probably licking on it. But I like these sorghums, these milos, because the deer are going to use them. I'm getting great roots in the soil. And even though the deer aren't eating this, it's my weed protection for my next crop, and those roots were my tillage. And when they're decomposing, they're awesome worm food. And then there's enough sunlight, I don't plant it at a full rate in between, that I just broadcast over it. And when we broadcast, we have one guy go north and south, one guy go east and west. That way, if the old man doesn't walk straight, we still got coverage. So I try never to say, okay, I'm planting a quarter acre, I got a quarter acre seed, I pour it on my broadcaster, and just do this, because you you will either have a whole bunch left over when you get to the end or not enough. And you go, oh my gosh, I got in my field I didn't plant. So I like to put small amounts in my broadcaster and one guy will go one direction, one go the other, and hopefully you got double back sun to empty all the seed in your broadcaster. You'll get better coverage that way. Tilt them up, you'll throw a little bit wider and you know, just get better coverage that way. 
just like this. And you can tell it's cloudy, and I look like a drowned or wet because it's raining. I like broadcasting in the rain. And Mick with the Ward Lab folks has been to our place too, and Ryan, and we were pulling forage samples, not so much for deer hunting, but I wanted to see how much fertilizer value that past crop had. And, and if you're planting a good blend, a good quality blend, it will look like dirt and feces out there, and you're going, man, I'm not going to have anything. But once other things green up, the deer are going to back off this because it's matured and in a bolt, and I commonly have seal rye five or six feet tall. Commonly. Commonly. And you get a lot of tons that way, and that becomes, they took that back to the lab and ran analysis, and I don't remember exact numbers, Patrick might, but it was pretty high quality. There was a lot of nutrients in there. More than enough nitrogen for the next crop without paying for any. All right, here we are. And if I stop, if you look between the milo, you see all the new crop coming on. And that buck at that time is eating some of the new green stuff. See him smelling, no, I like that, I don't like that, I like that. It's like you kids, man, they're picky. And he's smelling around, oh, look at that. Perfect position. How'd that happen? And notice it's right next to where we cut a bunch of cedars for bedding. That little hidey old food plot bordered bedding. But we come in from one direction to let the deer come from the other way. Sometimes you take an old trail where the farmer fed cattle through there, and you just, get, you just gotta get enough sunlight down. 50% sunlight will work, more is better. But 50% will work, and all of a sudden, pre-acorn fall, the deer are going, that's the only food in the neighborhood. He heard that, were you watching his ears? Watch that ear work, oh my, oh dang, too late. Didn't get much penetration, but he piled up right there. Or here in Kansas, I got one of our pro staffers, people film for us, has nine acres. Nine acres. He didn't see a deer all summer. Because that field behind him, we see an opening right through the trees, is corn or soybeans all summer long, every summer. Corn soybeans, corn soy, corn soy, corn soy. Here we go. Poor soil. <laughs> Another farmer living off a government check somewhere. Got a little hidey old food plot in here. And every year, Jeff will bring us great footage of one big monster, Kansas, you allowed one, off his nine acres. I know people that own a thousand acres and don't have the success Jeff has. Hidey old food plot. Deer browse it hard. I mean, once that crop is cut on that thousand acre farm, he's got the only food for a round. I contend that food plots are a viable economic concern from an erosion point of view, from a weed spreading point of view, because Southerners love to mow food plots. And you've seen it on the back of more deck, there's about three to five inches of duff, or maybe a foot of duff on there. That is better known as a broadcast planter, because you mowed because there's weeds. So weed seeds get all over your mower. Then you drive across the farm to go mow another plot, and you shake weed seeds off the whole way, and shake it off in the next plot. At my place, when we mow a field, we got a broom and tractor, we get off and sweep the back of it off, so we get a little pile of weed seeds right there if we mow. We almost never mow, almost never mow, but if we mow. Food plots are a big thing, and big food plots are great for nutrition of deer, but I would tend to one rather hunt a hidey hole food plot if I want to put venison in the freezer. And I want to just share with you some strategies and some hunting strategies about hidey hole food plots and a couple takeaways is I do plant summer blends in my hidey hole food plots to improve the soil and to keep weeds at bay so I don't have to use herbicide. Because a hidey hole food plot, you know, from me to Keith and over here to the wall, is not big enough that if five old nanny does get in there, a deer will eat uh, about 5% uh, of its body weight a day. So 100 pound deer, 5 pounds. But that doesn't seem like much, but you think about vegetation that's growing actively growing is about 70% water. So all of a sudden, that old doe's eating 13 to 16 pounds of wet weight forage a day to come up with that five pounds dry weight. And that's a lot. That's like more than a bushel basket. That's a lot, depending on the plant and the moisture and all that. So I plant not as desirable, like I would never just plant pure soybeans in a quarter acre food plot. Because two old does, you know, the ads show a bean seven feet tall, boy, I plant this. It didn't talk about a bean being this tall. And those deer down there with their lips on the ground, getting together. And those beans never get a chance to express their potential.
because they got nipped off where they got going and they couldn't regrow. I want something that's going to regrow, survive it. Sun hemp is awesome because it's got a woody stem. Deer don't like that woody stem, so eat the leaves, more leaves come out. Eat the leaves, more leaves come out. Sun hemp tests out about like alfalfa. There's a lot of good plants that you can put in these small plots and have some desirable forage and improve the soil for your fall plot. Thank you all very much for having me out today.